Okay. Hey, fandom, welcome back. Thanks for joining us tonight. We got a good show for you. We are going to talk about draft prospects for the Carolina Panthers. Looks like they're looking at quarterback. Of course, offensive tackle is a need. Uh, you know, we're going to break it all down. And we've got John Lobb here. He is a college and pro football analyst. He works for Football Diehards. He's co host of the Draft Seminar podcast. And uh, he's going to help us understand exactly who these players are. So, we will discuss that in just a few moments. First of all, if you like this show, if you're intrigued, if you learn something at the end, of course, give us a like, give us a subscribe. We appreciate that. And uh, we, we always appreciate your support. So let's do this. Christian McCaffrey, the open field. Inside the 30, inside the 20. McCaffrey touchdown. Okay, welcome back to the show, Mr. John Lobb. We've had you on before, friend of the show. We appreciate you coming on. Yes, thank First of you. all, sir, how are you tonight? I'm doing great. As um, we spoke before the show, it's my daughter's 12th birthday, so we just got back from dinner. I'm in a great mood. My daughter's super happy. Whenever your 12-year-old is happy on your birthday, daddy's happy. So, But now I'm ready to talk some Carolina Panthers in the draft. Well, your daughter's in good company. Today is ah. my mother's birthday. Oh, ah, well. happy birthday so, to her. So good, good people are, are born today. So that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> just real quick, um, you know, I'm, my name is Jeff Hasley. I'm your host, and I'm joined by Cowboy Joe as well as Brittany, her husband, Tom. And we are going to give you a quick rundown of your quarterback prospects. We want to talk about that. Who's Carolina targeting in the first round? Also, offensive tackle prospects. And, John, I want to get your take on your thoughts on Terrace Marshall. I know we talked about him last year. He was a, a, a big wide receiver prospect for you. And I'm just really kind of curious what you think about him. So those of our – that's kind of like our, uh, our outline here for tonight. I guess let, let's start off with quarterback prospects. Yeah, John, so who are your top four quarterbacks? Ah, all right. At the top of my board, and um, I'm very comfortable on this island all by myself, it is Sam Howell of the Carolina Tar Heels. Wow. When I put him into my model, he hits five of the six benchmark stats that I'm looking for. Nice. I, you have to study all three years of his film. Mm. You cannot just focus on this season. Young breakout star. He started immediately as a freshman when Mac Brown came in. I think he was originally going to go to Florida State. And somehow Mac Brown got him at the last second, came up to North Carolina, went up to North Carolina. I believe he's from North Carolina, right? Isn't he a, a North Carolina yep. kid? Yep. Yeah. So he went to his home state school instead of Florida State. 37 career starts. And you've got to see the difference in his performance from sophomore to senior year to understand this young man. And I admit that he played, he didn't look as good this year, but you have to put in context. He lost Javonta Williams, Michael Carter, Diami Brown, Daz Newsom, and I think three starters on the offensive line. I don't look at this season as a negative. In my book, it's a positive. The young man fought. He never gave up. He changed his game. He became a running quarterback. I think he had 800 yards rushing. Yeah. I love that. I mean, he showed – I knew he was athletic because you watched the first two years. He manipulated the pocket. He scrambled. He moved around. There was athleticism there. But he didn't have to run. When you got Michael Carter and all these weapons, you're kind of foolish to run. But this year he had a run, and he was unbelievable. He's at the top of my board. I know I'm pretty alone on that, but that's who I have at number one. Go ahead, so, Jeff. Looks like you have a question. So, yeah, John, uh, my graphic here has Matt Corral, Kenny Pickett, <laughs> and Malik Willis, right, uh, as far as the quarterback is, uh, comparison is, is concerned. And we could talk about Sam Howell. I think that's uh, actually – you know, I like, I like these uh, against-the-grain type of, of picks because it seems like he's a little bit lower in other people's consensus – is it because the fact that he kind of dropped down a little bit this past year versus uh, 2020? 
I do. I mean, if we if it, if it was last summer and you're in the dynasty or Debbie community or you're just a draft Nick, how old was consensus top two? When yeah. you looked around the board, obviously some people had different players at one or two, but he was pretty much consensus. And I think too many, and this is my opinion, they're focusing too much on this year. And they're really using this year as a barometer to ding the young man. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a negative. I just, I really don't. And when I plug them, I, I, I'm, I watch a ton of film. So I know, like there's, if you watch Howell this year, he took too many hits. Please, young man, learn to slide a little bit in the NFL because those linebackers and safeties in the NFL are going to hit you harder than they did in college. I mean, he was great around the goal line, and he and he put his shoulder down too much. But we know in the NFL, you can't succeed on a regular basis like that. But he's got what I like, moxie, fortitude, determination, experience. My friends, he can come in day one and call signals at the NFL level. I'm convinced of it. If you can step up from high school into a major college football program at 18 or 19, I don't know his exact birth date, but you do that at that young age and you turn that program around. I'm a big college football freak. Before Mac Brown, the Tar Heels had slipped a lot. And Mac Brown has turned them around. And guess what? Sam Howell is, I mean, yeah, he's the guy. I mean, we'll see how they do without Sam Howell. I think Tarfield, Tar Heel fans are, might be in for a little bit of surprise now that Howell left. Um, so, and, and, so back to my analytics. When I look at every number, he pops. I love this. He averaged 9.2 yards per attempt. He's the highest in this class, only next to Caleb Ellaby. <laughs> who's from Western Michigan, and he's like an undrafted free agent. If you know these gimmicky Mac offenses, you get a lot of you get a lot of yak yards. You get a lot of easy long touchdowns. So, Howell played in the ACC, a career. That's nine point two in a career. That's thirty seven games played. This young man is not dinking and dunking for thirty seven starts, my friends. Yeah. His Passing efficiency since he was 18 or 19, 164.2. I'm looking at 155 as a benchmark. Boom, he smashes that. And my favorite number with him, 92 touchdowns, only 23 interceptions. He's smart. He's efficient. He's good with the football. Now, what surprised me the most? I knew he was doing well yardage-wise. Running the football, he had a 30% rushing equity. He had 30% of the rushing yards of the Tar Heels this year. Let me put it in a little perspective. Since 2014, here are some of the rushing equity numbers. Deshaun Watson, 33%. Um, Jalen Hurts, 39%. Dak Prescott, 33%. And Lamar Jackson off the charts at 49%. You're, and everyone else, Trevor Lawrence, 16. Patrick Mahomes, 18. Baker Mayfield, 14. Joe Burrow, 18. Kyler Murray, 29%. He had a higher percentage of teams rushing yards. He's athletic. He's smart. He's good with the football. He doesn't turn it over. Is he perfect? No. That's why he's not the number one pick in the draft. I mean, he doesn't deserve to be the number one pick. I don't think there's a guy in the top ten. We'll talk about that later. But they will get pushed up the board. And, Jeff, we'll move on to the next three. Those are my three next guys. You hit them all right, but Howell's my guy at the top of the board. And I'm willing to be on the island alone. Anyone who knows me, I was huge on Dak Prescott. I was huge on Jalen Hurts, and people told me I was crazy, and I never got off those – and I'm not going to get off Howell right now. So you, do you think he's actually the best fit for Carolina? Uh, so this is – I knew that question was coming up. <laughs> I don't think there's a six pick in the draft worth Carolina. But you're desperate, right? I mean, what do you do here? We're Sam Darnold desperate. <laughs> or, or we could see like a draft that happened last year that everybody got nervous when J.C. Horn went off the board and everybody went – 
cornerback. So do you think Carolina will hold that six or trade out? On at that this aspect? point, I'm looking at the board. They got to trade out. They have to. I think someone said they have one pick in the top 100. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of depth in this draft. And Carolina's so far away, you got to have bodies on that team. Yeah. You know, you might as well take a guy like Desmond Ritter in the second round if you can pick up a second round pick. I, I think you got to trade down. That's just, that's, if I was Carolina, that's what I would do. Because you got to, you got to get a quarterback, but I don't think the number six pick, even though one might go in the top five because of supply and demand. I don't, oh, beautiful dog. I don't think Thank one you. is worth it. He's very it. needy tonight. <laughs> Um, I don't think one is worth it. That's just my opinion. All right, so let's hear your other remaining, uh, I guess, the next three here that we have on the screen. Kenny Pickett's my number two. He's 48 career starts. I love that. Oh, my God. He's ready to – he should – he's, he's going to be 24 at kickoff. But you have an experienced quarterback. He should be able to come in from day one, learn your playbook. He should be able to, if you have an offense that is going to cater to his strengths, maybe rely on the run. You know, I don't think you want any of these young quarterbacks to throw the ball 550 times as rookies. I think that'd be like malfeasance as an offensive coordinator to make these kids throw that bad, that much. But if you have Kenny Pickett throw the ball 450, 500 times, and maybe you had an offense 55% run, 45% pass, I think Kenny Pickett can come in from day one and run your offense. But there are there are some really warning signs here in Kenny Pickett. Mm-hmm. I said the same thing about Howell. I look at the body of work. You cannot ignore 2020 and 2019. He wasn't good. You know, he only threw 13 interceptions in each of those seasons and like nine and ten interceptions. Like he was literally bad. If we, if there was not that I know of, and I don't know every Debbie person, I don't know every draft expert, I did not see Kenny Pickett in the top 10 of any Debbie listing or any draft listing because his body of work before kickoff last year was rather unimpressive to say the least. Now, did he make a gargantuan leap? 44 touchdowns. I think he had seven interceptions if my old man brain um, is right. So I I have to look at the leap. I have to listen to the NFL scouts. The big guys in the NFL industry really like him. There's some who have him at the top of the board. I've seen others have him as low as four. So there's what I love about this class. There's massive difference of opinions on all leap. There's no easy analysis this year. Mm -hmm. I was talking about benchmarks. He only hits two of my six. Wow. Because I have to take it over the four years that he played at Pitt. Mm -hmm. And he was so, he played so poorly. And I'm not trying to be mean, but he played so poorly in 2019 and 20. His numbers are way down. As an example, this is what scares me. 48 starts for Pickett. 7.3 yards in attempt. 7.3 7.3 yards an attempt wow. mm-hmm. in 48 games. Let me just say that's pretty bad, folks. <laughs> yeah. like, that's bad. How will 9.2? And I'm going to say something. If you love Dynasty Debbie or you just love the draft, Pittsburgh has a Blitnikoff winner, Jordan Addison. And I'm telling you, every time I saw Kenny Pickett throw a 30-yard touchdown, Guess who's on the receiving end? Addison. Addison. Yep. Right now, Addison is my number four Debbie wide receiver in the in the in the upcoming draft. He's unbelievable. We might look back four years from now and go, oh, that was a Jordan Addison offense, <laughs> not a Kenny Pickett offense. There's a lot of downside with Pickett. But the good news is you have seen incredible growth. And I do think he can start from day one. So if you want to start that rookie clock, you want to see if he's good in two years, boom. You, I really, I'm not trying. You could throw him right out there right away and see if he's any good. So that's the good news. You're, you're going to start the clock and throw him out there. 
but there's a wide range of outcomes with Kenny Pickett. Number three, Matt Corral. He's the interesting one. Lane Kiffin's offense is quarterback friendly. But then he played in the SEC, which is defensively, it's hard to play in the SEC. 32 career starts. Corral's the only other guy this year who hits five of my six benchmarks. Hmm. Corral is a much better rusher than people give him credit for. 1,321 rushing yards. In his best year, 22% rushing equity. And if you watch the game against Tennessee, Lane Kiffin actually, to me, um, committed coaching malfeasance. I used that word twice. I shouldn't have used it again. <laughs> he ran Matt Corral 30 times against Tennessee. I've never seen someone do that. You cannot run your quarterback 30 times. No. And I'm telling you, Corral got hurt. He never reported it. He's a tough kid. And you look at Corral's box scores, and if you watch Corral from the time he got – I mean, Tennessee buried the young man. You can't carry the football 30 times. The quarterback, he's only 205 pounds listed. And he's played an SEC defense, and Tennessee's not the top of the world, but you still got 300-pound – Defensive yeah. lineman out there. And so, and you look at Corral, he didn't play the same game. Then he got hurt in the bowl game. Yep. So I like Corral a lot, but there are things I don't, you know, there are some concerns. He hits the only benchmark he doesn't hit, which is interesting touchdown interception ratio. One, they ran the ball a lot near the goal line. If you watch Mississippi this year, they had three running backs. They had some big boys. I think his name was Snoop, something Snoop. I mean, they just – they ran – and even even Corral had like eight rushing touchdowns or something silly. So his, his touchdowns are – passing are down compared to others mm-hmm. because of the way they structured the offense near the goal line. But he had 57 touchdowns, 23 interceptions. But what hurt him, if you remember, 2020 – Corral threw six interceptions against Arkansas. Mm-hmm. He just had a freaking nightmare. <laughs> Literally a nightmare game. I don't know what happened, how the young man, what happened. Did he have a bad week? Something happened on campus. I give him one credit, though. He stayed in a game. How many young men, when they throw their fourth and fifth interception, they're just going, coach is going to go, son, do you want to you want to take a bench seat? <laughs> How many coaches were, or they would just go, son, get your ass on the bench. That's your fourth or fifth touch the interception. <laughs> but Corral went up there and threw a sixth. <laughs> I mean, and then there, I read somewhere there, there's a story, and it's hard, you know, I'm not a reporter, I'm not there. But allegedly, Kiffin went up to him after the Arkansas game and said, do you need a week off? Do you want to play next week? And Corral said, I'm going to play. Never miss the game. So I do see mental fortitude there. So you take out that six-interception game, and his numbers aren't as bad, touchdown to interception. And I'm not convinced that one game now is really reflective. Let's look at it as a real learning experience, and something clearly went wrong. I mean, you – how many players do you treat? This is Joe Namath's absurdity when Joe used to throw four or five interceptions in like 1972, you know? Like you don't throw six interceptions. So Corral's my number three. I know the bright, shining object is Malik Willis. You know, it's funny you mentioned and that he's in your – because I this has been going around Panthers Twitter like on the timeline. Like a lot of people seem to be – Hi, on Malik Willis. What can you tell us? Tell us about him as far as where you have him ranked. I, I, I'm fascinated with this one just because I see the most uh, hype surrounding him. First, I think there's a market correction occurring. Mm. People missed out on Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts, and they think that Malik Willis is the next Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts, and they are so determined not to be wrong again. They're actually elevating Willis. Willis is not the prospect Mm. that Jalen Hurts was. I'm sorry. They're just – I had a second-round grade on Hurts. Hurts was my number four quarterback. I have him on four of my six dynasty teams because I took him in the second round. One time he fell to the third round. I'm like, look at man. I can't let a dual-threat quarterback. And I had Lamar Jackson. I have a team with Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts. But when you're in the super flex – 
and Jalen Hurts is sitting there in the third round. I'm just like, sorry, got you know. I think I have Kirk Cousins and and Carson Wentz. I had a you know. You just got to take them. I can't let some. I have to you know. I have to punish the room for allowing Jalen Hurts to fall to the third round. So now everyone is like, oh, what did I miss? What did I do wrong? Wh- wh- why? And what they see, and there are aspects of Willis's game that will mirror Hurts or Jackson. But he's not hes not as good as those two. Jackson's off the charts better. I mean, I, I should have even been higher on Jackson than I was, and I think I had him fourth coming out that year, and I think he was the fifth quarterback. I think the Ravens took the last pick with him yep. when they acquired him that year. And I had him at number four. Willis isn't the isn't those two players. You can't compare Liberty. I'm sorry, folks. Liberty is not Oklahoma, Alabama, and Louisville. Mm-hmm. And I love the G5. But please, <laughs> anyone, I dare you to look at Liberty's schedule for the last two years. And other than Mississippi and Coastal Carolina, name a team they played. <laughs> and everyone last year lectured us on Zach Wilson having an easy schedule of BYU. Oh, hello. <laughs> if you thought Zach Wilson had an easy schedule, check out Liberty's schedule for the last two years, folks. Don't give me – if you're going to do apples to apples, if you're going to sit here and tell me that Zach Wilson had it easy, how the hell are you sitting here and telling me that Malik Willis' schedule at Liberty was any good? And the one game he played against Mississippi, he got smacked around like a donut. Man, he just got they, – they looked terrible against Mississippi. So that's there, – there, there's issues. And I know – I like him. I have a second-round grade. Mm. But I said this about Trey Lance last year. Malik Willis is not ready to get on the field from day one. He is not ready to play at the NFL level – from day one. What he can do is he can move the chains with his legs, that, that's all, and make some big plays deep downfield, maybe. But Trey Lance needed to sit this year. Mm. And Garoppolo played well enough to keep Lance on the bench. And people thought I was crazy. And people thought that Trey Lance was going to start week four. I mean, there were people in best ball leagues drafting Trey Lance in the eighth round last year. You got two games out of him. <laughs> you. Mm. Malik Willis is not ready. Now, athleticism off the charts. But I have not seen it, and this is not the only way to win at the quarterback position. I have not seen him sit in the pocket, keep his feet steady, and complete intermediate passes. He can complete the short passes well. He can chuck it when he's scrambling 40 yards down the field. But guess what? Those are against defensive backs at the who aren't even sniffing the NFL. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> and they probably had a fire code. If Malik runs, you two just go deep. Like <laughs> literally, if you see Malik running, you go deep. And you know what? When that happens against bad defensive backs, they're just going to screw up once in a while. So what if Malik yeah. will do? Throw a bullet 45 yards down the field. It's not happening as often in the NFL. I do think Lamar Jackson got better at throwing from the pocket. Was he perfect? No. And there is some legitimate criticism. Lamar Jackson's got to get better throwing the ball outside the hash marks. He cannot live for five years thrown in in the middle of the field. It's just not going to work in the long run. He's got to get better throwing outside the hash marks. Does Malik Wills have an NFL arm? Absolutely. There's no question does he have an NFL arm. Completion percentage, it's nice. It's below Howell. His yards per attempt are below Howell. The only thing he has is the Russian equity, and I get it. There's no question. But I'm not going to make a market correction and propel him to the top because I screwed up on Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts. Luckily, I didn't screw up on Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts. So I don't have to make the mark, but I do. There are literally people who had Jalen Hurts outside their top 10 prospects at quarterback. Like, I literally heard people saying Jalen Hurts can't play quarterback in the NFL. 
And people were like, come on. I'm like, no, did you watch Oklahoma? Did you plug in the numbers into a model? What are you talking about? He played for two of the best coaches in the history. That, well, he played for the best coach, Nick Saban, and Lincoln Riley is clearly one of the great offensive minds in the game. I'm sorry. When you're around great minds like that, you're going to learn. And everything I read, Jalen Hurts was, was a brilliant leader, a good learner, willing learner. Yeah, I know he's got some problems. He's not the most accurate guy. I get it. But who did he have? Devonta Smith? I mean, please. You know, give me give me Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, and let's see what we can do if we're Jalen Hurts. You know, like, so he needs some help, and he's got to grow. But I can't say that Malik Willis is – I don't even think he's close to Jalen Hurts ready. So I have him at number four. And everyone, if you want to know, find some film – Watch him when he's in the pocket. And one thing that concerns me, he, when the pocket breaks down, he runs to run. Powell, Pickett, and Corral, they run to complete a pass. Will they take the rushing lane when it's there? Yes. They would prefer they keep their eyes downfield and they're willing to throw the ball. Willis, he's so talented. Those linemen were so slow compared to him. He was more than willing to take the 12 yards off the scramble. And I don't think you can live an NFL career like that. I do not. I, I would. Hey, he might go number six. <laughs> I think you're stone cold crazy because he's not ready. And if you throw him out there, I think you're just going to hurt him. I mean, Patrick Mahomes sat for a year. Carson mm -hmm. Palmer sat for a year. Trey Lance only played two games. I do not think you want to bring in Malik Wills with the expectation of him starting 17 games. No, and you, and you bring a great point there because right now I have, I have a two-parter. Your thoughts on McAdoo as the offensive coordinator and these four young men, which one would McAdoo love to work with? He wants – okay, so based on what I saw with the Giants, I'm going to go there because I think that's when we saw him. He led that first year with OBJ and Eli, and they made the playoffs. I think they were like, what, 10-1 and one at one point. They, they choked at the end, and then they lost their playoff game. But one thing that Eli does, he's an anticipatory passer. Mm. And in McAdoo's system, you have to get the ball out of your hands quick and you have to be an anticipatory passer. And one thing that Eli, that Eli did, and it's now interesting because people don't give Eli enough credit. Odell had his best years with Eli. Mm. Because you know what? Eli trusted Odell. Baker Mayfield, obviously, I don't even know what he's doing. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, seriously. But Eli had ultimate faith in Odell. And you can criticize him if you want, but look it. He knew that Odell would be where he had to be. And even if he wasn't open, Eli threw the ball to the spot. And he, he said, Odell's going to be there. And, and so if I look at that, I do think it's Pickett or Corral. But I'm not convinced they're the best long-term answers. I, you see, I, honestly, I don't think Corral, Pickett, or Howell, or Willis are worth the sixth pick in the draft. There, this is, I don't think you want. Now, if you told me they had a second round pick and a third round pick, then maybe I could take one on the quarterback here. I'm going to draft the quarterback with pick six. When's their next pick, Jeff? Do you have it in front of you? What number are they looking it's, at? It's like 106 or 104 or something like that. Man, that is, yeah, that is a lot of talent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a lot of starters that you're just passing. Mm -hmm. For a quarterback, that might not be worth the value there in my book. Right. But I understand supply and demand, right? I mean, these organizations are desperate. That, so that's why I do think four of these young men are going in the first round. I have no doubt in my mind that four of them are going to be picked in the first round. It's too many teams desperate for a quarterback. Now, see, I'm on the opposite spectrum, my friend. Uh, no, I'm kind of all about the offensive tackle. Now, um, Oh, okay, not you're not saying draft the quarterback. You're saying right. you say you in the first round. Who are the offensive tackle prospects that you recommend? 
who would be there at six that the Panthers could really kind of plug in right away and, you know, get something going because our offensive line has been in the shitter. Okay? <laughs> so we need help. SOS, like we're the Titanic. Help us, John. Help well, us. I would love Evan Neal, but there's no way he's falling. He's going to be one of the top two picks in the draft. Okay. He's the guy. I mean, I think it's going to be very hard for Detroit. And I was just – so Jacksonville and Detroit, it will be very hard to pass up that offensive tackle. Now, the guy I like for your system, mm. and I think they're they're probably going to have to throw the ball. They're not going to ground and pound. They, they don't have that right now. Right. The young man, Charles Cross from Mississippi State, Okay, I think he can step in and pass block from day one. Now, if you know Mike Leach's system – he throws the ball about 78% of the time at Mississippi State. Mm. Cross can come in, I do believe. At worst, he could play right tackle. You might be able to play him at left tackle. You know, it's hard to say when, you know, you know you'd know, have to get him in train camp to see. But at worst, play him at right tackle immediately with the hope year two, you move him over to left tackle. I do like Kenyon Green. Mm. But after Neil and I, this, what do you have there? Okunuwu, they have it second. Yeah. So, I mean, he's like my fourth or fifth guy. Um, but that's all right. The sixth spot is a weird – yeah, in a perfect world, Evan Neal would fall there, but there's no quarterbacks. Like, I think if this was a year where there were two or three quarterbacks, you might actually get Evan Neal mm-hmm. at number six. But the, the without that franchise quarterback, yeah. they're going to go for the stud Alabama left tackle who can play – from day one, but I, I, I'm not Brittany. I'm not against taking a tackle ever. How does like this year's um, tackle draft class, how does that compare to last year? I think it's better. It's I think better. It's, yeah. I think you could get it. You're going to be able to get a tackle in round two. If okay. you really need one. I mean, obviously they're not the top guys, but I think you're going to be able to find tackles in this draft. Oh, you that- know, ironically, sorry, Tom, one second. Ironically, the only weak position in some ways is the quarterback, which is the one everyone wants, but that's a different story. Is Evan Neal going to be as good as Slater? Good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't happy. have my Slater. And I mean, it's going to be close. <laughs> you know, no. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have my Slater outlook in front of me. I didn't think about that. But I think it'll be close, my friend. Well, let me ask you. My favorite offensive tack, not even tackle, offensive lineman is Tyler Lennonbaum. Where's he ranked on your? On oh, your he's tackle? number five. The tack from Iowa, right? The young yeah. man from yeah. Iowa yeah. center. Yeah. See, so Lennonbaum to me is your classic, and I love Iowa and Wisconsin <laughs> offensive linemen. And I think I read somewhere is I think the Big Ten has the most offensive linemen in the NFL. So I know there's, you know, give me the SEC wide receivers. G- you know, give me the linemen from the Big Ten um, and running backs from the SEC. So he, to me, is your classic. He's p- great value of pick number 24 in the first round. I don't think you can go top 10 with him. I don't. I just don't think he's that talent. I mean, I like him. I mean, I have him at f- four, but I don't think he's there. I don't think he's top 10. Wise move to trade back and get him. Well, that's that. I think you should trade back, though. At least, maybe even twice. Yeah, trade. that would be. Look, it. You've got to have assets. Last year, the Panthers made a really big splash in the draft by how <laughs> much they traded around and statement. jumped around. Do you do you see that? Do you project something like that? They got to like, do something. Yeah. Do you like? I mean, I think they're stone cold nuts to have one pick in the top hundred and six. I can't do that. Not when I'm a bad team. Yeah, let's say what? Let's say the um, I don't know who who lost the, the Chiefs. If the Chiefs had one in the top hundred and twenty, okay, you know maybe I can get one playmaker. I can start. I can wait and fill bodies. I would assume the Panthers need at least five new starters on both sides of the ball by next year. I can't do that if I have one pick that deep. And I say at so least four in the offensive line. Now. What? I say four in the offensive line. Yeah. They, yeah. Three. Now, the problem is you got about five teams all desperate to improve the offensive line. Yep. And I was actually looking. Here's the problem if you're the Panthers. Houston, the Jets, 
and the Giants all before them. all must fix their offensive line. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I mean, every I can make an argument that the Giants and the Jets have to pick offensive linemen. I mean, I, the Giants, the Jets have the pieces now. Now I know some people want the wide receiver. I get it. Bill, I'm I'm old. Build the line, build the line, build the line. Mm-hmm. I'll find a wide receiver in round three. Mm-hmm. Right. But I've got to build. Look at what the Chiefs did. Didn't they lose four starters from last year and they rebuilt it in yeah, one year? In one year. And they plucked, didn't their center, their freshman their rookie center, like made the Pro Bowl or something? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah. So I've got to rebuild the line. Now, obviously, it was coaching too. I mean, obviously, Andy Reid and the staff knew what to do. And, and Mahomes can hide some mistakes. But I'm old school, build the line, build the line, build the mm-hmm. line. John, is there any specific maybe like middle of the first, end of the first round tackle that you think would be that's a little bit under the radar that, that they could <coughs> potentially target, especially if they trade down? Now, here's one that's interesting. Trevor Penning out of University of Northern Illinois. Iowa? Northern Iowa. Oh, Iowa. You're right. Sorry. 3.36.7, and he was great at the Senior Bowl. I mean, he was one of the guys everyone is looking at. Like, can he, from a group of five program, Northern Illinois, can he transfer and compete against NFL-level defensive ends and pass rushers? And he did. Like, I, if, if I'm like the Chiefs, if I'm the Bills, like, he's the perfect guy you want. You yeah. know, hey, maybe he plays, you know, he's bench depth year one, but you plug in a 330-pound right tackle in 2023 your goal so i think he's going to go right in that 25 to 35 spot and then nicholas pettit frary of ohio state he's i like him too ohio state kids tend to be able to pass block you know Mm -hmm. so you can get a pass blocker there i'm thinking if there's anyone else i like i don't think there's anyone else higher at this level oh uh, he is that guy Daniel Filele of the Minnes. Have you heard of this kid? Yeah, he's huge. He's huge. like he's 380 or something. Now, yeah, I've got to see what he like does at the combine. And he lost weight. Yeah, look it. I don't think he should play at 387. Probably if you got him at 350, 360, yeah. you probably, you know, but look, he's an interesting player. I mean, you can't coach size. I mean, you got you got the goddamn size. I mean, holy shit! It kind of reminds me of the um, uh, the Eagles tackle that they got. Who yeah, was kinda... he did from was it Australia or something? Yes, yeah. And yeah. he sat. Did he? Is yeah. it? Because my friend at work is an Eagles fan, and I think he sat for two years. Yeah. And now he was unbelievable. Yeah. And he's like three hundred sixty or three hundred seventy pounds, yeah. something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so John, um, I want to talk about Terrace Marshall. Ah, uh, we're gonna switch. We're gonna switch gears. I know sure. that you were a bit. You came on the show last year. You were big, hooting and hollering with Terrace Marshall, and everybody was. I mean, his numbers showed it, right? And yeah, he, I had him in my top ten. He was he number eight from, or nine. He comes from a you know a a, a very highly well known you know school in LSU in terms of wide receiver talent and depth. I'm going to put up a graphic here that, that oh, no. shows his stats from this past year. <laughs> it might be a little bit small. You might need to uh, increase the uh, the size on your screen there. But yeah, I have um, the, I have his numbers, his total numbers. Sure. I mean, the first couple games is you know he did fairly decent, right? You know, he didn't score a touchdown all year, but the first couple games he did decent, and then like after week six, <laughs> he has three catches. Now. So, my 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 question to you, and I've, all Panthers fans want to hear about this, is what's your take on Marshall? Is there any meat on the bone there? Um, I mean, I know he's young. He's young. He's 21 years old. And, you know, of course, Carolina had to deal with the whole Sam Darnold fiasco. Um, McCaffrey being out, the, the the offense just kind of in shambles a little bit, right? So and they got rid of Joe Brady. What you, what the, week did they get rid of Joe Brady? Uh, good question. Like oh, week 13. twelve or 13. after the bye, wasn't it like the oh, bye okay. week? 
Yeah, yeah like week yeah. 12 or 13, something like that. He and it was, basically... on a Saturday, it was on like a Monday because he wasn't available on a Saturday or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. And he basically... it, was, it was before the bye week. Yeah. And he basically before? never came <laughs> back on the field, Terrence Marshall, after they got rid of Brady. Not that yeah, he was so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Terrence Marshall. And, you know, I, obviously he, the only way he can go is up, right? Um, just kind of curious what you think. Well, obviously, I would grade him at like a D minus for his freshman year. It is not encouraging. We know in general we would prefer to have our freshman quarterbacks come in and have them – or run or wide receivers, I'm sorry. At least show 400 yards, 500 yards receiving. So to have 170 – is it 170? I think it was 178, 138. Oh, my God. 138, yeah. That's not good. But – you spent the second round pick, and you, we've already discussed they have a dearth of picks this year. There is no way I can give up on this young man yet. Something obvious, something behind the scenes that we don't know. When you go from there, you go, let's see, first three games, 14 targets and um, 10 receptions. Mm. He didn't come close to that the rest of the year. Right. So something went wrong that we yeah. don't know. The Panthers lost. I know, well, I know the answer. Well, he played Dallas, and then he didn't do anything at the Dallas. But. but, I mean, was it inability to get the playbook? Was he running the wrong routes? Was he just a nightmare in the locker room or in the film room? Like, something went wrong that we don't have, and it doesn't. There's no yeah, logic. And you know, it's really hard, too, because right now Carolina has a head coach who likes to blame the players and oh, not yeah. any responsibility well. for his <laughs> own shortcomings um, or acknowledge his role. I mean, you win as a team and you lose as a team, you know, and, and, and you had mentioned with the, you know, could it be something behind the scenes? I mean, for all we know, something could have happened behind the scenes. He didn't agree with something that, you know, rule or – you know, Brady well, wanted to put in place, and then they just, okay, rookie, you can. Yeah, I mean, to see a second-round pick literally, yeah. like, fall well, off yeah. the map, then he well, had, after those opening three games, he only had four receptions in the next three. And then from week seven to 16, no, 15, he didn't have a catch. And then he had three catches in 15 and 16. Something going on. That us the fans are not aware. Right. Like, well, yeah. didn't Dorner well, get hurt right. like round weeks five and six? I think he might, but uh, but again, that, that we don't know. It wasn't. Too. Yeah, he was a healthy scratch one game too. Yes, but it, you have to yeah. keep in mind too the coaching carousel, uh, the quarterback carousel that Carolina played yeah. all year, like. One quarter, you see one quarterback. And, I mean, it is hard to get well, used to one guy when you're constantly adjusting the game plan, too, with a different quarterback. Darnold was in. Darnold got hurt yeah. um, with his shoulder. Then they had, you know, PJ right? came in doing? a little bit. Then they brought Cam in, and then they put PJ back him. in. And it was, a, it, it was very <laughs> just inconsistent. Dysfunctional. Wide receiver. Huh. It's I think at one point I even seen receiver. Rule play quarterback. <laughs> well, let's well let's ask ourselves this: How many receivers actually caught the balls in Carolina? Oh my God, <laughs> butterfingers this season! Look for a wide receiver. If you're not gelling with your quarterback, it's going to be hard for you to gel with anybody else. And if you're playing this uh, quarterback carousel with right. every player you have, it, it's going to cause confusion no matter what. Yeah, yeah and I mean, I mean, Rule can say it all. He's blue in the face that that these guys have practiced with all the quarterbacks. But practice and game time is two different things. Like, oh, these man. guys have different imprints. These quarterbacks have different styles, different, you know, ways that they're – different people even that, that you know, you're they're comfortable with. I mean, you, you – you got to know where each other is going to be at all times. Right, you got to know where each other is going to be at all times. And, I, you know, I definitely – feel like that that was uh, tell him to make a decision at quarterback and die with the damn decision right stick with it mm -hmm. well i mean to answer jeff's original question yeah there's no way i'm giving up on him right now no. No. You, no. you just absolutely cannot and i would even go further to say you haven't seen enough well, right no no he should be on the field for a greater percentage of snaps and see more targets i've right. got to find out if the young man can be my third or fourth receiver I mean, you can't waste. 
Mm. What was the 59th pick overall? Let me look right here. 59th overall. You cannot throw away the 59th overall pick and just say we're not going to pepper him with some targets. He's six foot two, 200 pounds. Prolific at LSU. Yes, I get the LSU. Obviously, the scheme helped him. But then study the LSU tape, find out what he did good, and duplicate it. Like, Mm -hmm. you've got to figure it out. And that's why, look at Joe Brady must have spoken up. He was there when Joe Brady is at LSU. He must have liked Terrence Marshall. Why would you take him with the 59th pick and then just disappears by week seven? Like, it is really bizarre. So I've got to see if the young man can play. Let me ask you this, John. There's been just rumor, you know, trade talks about Robbie Anderson. They trade Robbie. Is that a way to get Terrace? You know, you trade Robbie for a pick? I would. I would. There's no reason to have Robbie Anderson if you're the Carolina Panthers. Sir Terrace at number two on the other side? Yeah. Look it. By the time you're good or figure out the quarterback, Robbie Anderson's not going to be there. Right. Like, get something – Right now, Robbie Anderson has value in the league right now. A good playoff team or someone who wants depth chart, someone wants a home run hitter, get Rob, just trade, just, yes, and move Marshall up and let's see what he's got. Yeah. Yeah. I agree yep. with that. And I mean, especially since, you know, it, there's been talks that Robbie even wants to go back to the Jets. We can, you know, another bad team, maybe we can say here, <laughs> have him back. Yeah. We'll I mean, <laughs> hey, if I was on the precipice of the playoffs and I needed depth at wide receiver, I would have no problem trading for Robbie. And let me see, like, oh, Arizona, Las mm-hmm. Vegas, Tennessee, third round pick for Robbie Anderson. You're not going to give that. I think you have to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or maybe Jacksonville gets their fourth round pick. I mean, if look, if there's no reason Carolina should have, he doesn't do you any good. There's no, no. strategic, there's no organizational advantage and he's to keeping a veteran lot. player like that. Oh man, they they, they absolutely have smart. to. They they have to trade out of that sixth spot. They have to. I agree. You got to move. You got to try to get at least two picks in the top eighty, something like that. Luckily, yeah. Scott Fitterer is pretty good at trading down. Yes, look at here's what's going to happen. Denver, Washington, Atlanta. um I'm looking quickly. New Orleans, one of Pittsburgh, one of those teams are going to fall in love with one quarterback. That's all mm-hmm. you have to do. I've said it a million times. The Broncos fell in love with Tim Tebow. They spent the first round pick on him. You just if Pittsburgh, Washington likes one guy, they have their guy then you trade up. You've got to trade up with Carolina. And you've got to think out of those four organizations, one of them is going to move up and take it. You've got to figure one of them. That's mm-hmm. how I look at it. You know, and New Orleans is an ideal spot too. Be- well, they're in the division. They might not trade. Do you know how yeah. to Carolina New Orleans yeah. trade historically? Well, Cowboys Eagles traded last year, so maybe that's this I, I think it's and the Giants too. Giants yeah, we, and Cowboys. Yeah, right? but we did it. Yeah, yeah we but did we it. actually fucked the Saints because I'll tell you why. They wanted JC Horn, and we actually they were trying and we took him because the Joe Horn played for mm-hmm. the Saints. The Saints well, wanted JC, and we were like, Yeah, ha ha, you so maybe you can't get the tra- Saints, but you can get Pittsburgh. <laughs> I, I'd rather yeah. trade with Pittsburgh than the Saints. I would love to see the Saints just fall flat on their faces and be awful for a few years. I think the Saints really are awful. going to be bad for a while. Cowboys only story, traded but... with the Eagles to twist the knife in the Giants. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, but if, if there's no way Pittsburgh, in my book, can cross their fingers and hope a quarterback falls to number 20. No. Yeah, they're gonna That's, have to. They would probably be a a good candidate to trade up, yes. you know, with us. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna make the can, uh, the Panther fans a little uncomfortable here. Don't you always? I always do. I love it. <laughs> McCaffrey, what hmm. kind of trade commodity could he get? I would yeah. trade him if you got a second round pick. I'd do it in a heartbeat. Wow. I mean, and and by the time you're good, he's not going to be around, right? And but but here's here's the next part, piggybacking off of what Joe said. 
I'm open to this as a Panthers fan. I mean, he hasn't been consistent. He's been injured. At this point, what is what teams would still bite on somebody who hasn't had a consistently healthy season? Tampa Bay yeah, might. Tampa Bay? <laughs> they might. They Jeez. might because who knows what they're going to do with Fournette. Mm. Um, I'm just looking quickly here if there's a good playoff team. I don't think any of the playoff teams, they all have solid running backs. Mm. Um, Seattle maybe? No, I, I'm, I'm looking. Wow. Huh. Mm. Miami. Miami. <laughs> Miami. I mean, Miami, really, that's not a bad, you know, yeah. you're a new young coach. Maybe you want to bring him in and you you get something there. Uh, mm. I'm looking now. Arizona. Yeah, I guess that's the best. But are they happy with James Conner and – you know, or could you bring in both? I guess I think Connor's a free agent, though, didn't they? Yeah, Sam? he is. What about Saint Fran? Saint Fran, you know, loves those receiving uh, running backs. Yeah, but look, Shanahan's won't pay for a running back, dude. Yeah, right. They, their whole life, you go all the way back to his yeah, father. Exactly, it's true, though. You're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got, I mean, scary. The only other option, other than trading him for a pick, which would be ideal, would be, I mean, if for whatever reason nobody. Bit. I mean, you could get well, what about the Cardinals? The use them a nice more running back. Doctor, I would think then, because I mean, with the grounds that he hasn't been healthy, I mean, as the perfect kind of leverage, and I mean, obviously, depending on cost, right? Right, if, like if, who's if, gonna want to? Who's gonna want to eat that? Like the cost of Christian McCaffrey, and the commies. That's part the of the whole coach got to eat some of it. Yeah, the commies. I mean, we've eaten <laughs> the, enough. The commies wouldn't eat. mind it. Yeah, did they, they, they got the coach right. By the way, did they did anyone ever mention that the Commodores is too easily the commies? Did that never come up? Like, I don't get it. Like, I'm on. just waiting for Dallas and, and uh Washington commies yeah. versus America's team. Is <laughs> the easiest oh thing God. ever. Um, I don't know. Um, look, I would if if I was the magic wand, the Panther, right. I'm trading McCaffrey. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I mean, that would be the most ideal. He's your best asset. By the time you're good, he's not going to be around. I mean, it just really doesn't make – and I know people thought Chuba was bad. I think in the situation, go with him for one more year. Next year's running back class is loaded. <laughs> the 2003 running backs are loaded. Exactly. Let's see what he has. Let's see what yeah, he has. if Chuba's any good, right? Let's see him get 210 carries. If he stinks, who cares? It's a running back. I mean, I honestly think you could get a second and probably a fifth for McCaffrey. I would do that in a heartbeat. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry might give him a first round and, pick. And, <laughs> and the is we need it. I mean Minnesota. And that's that's the key. We have to Minnesota? we have to build nah. ourselves back no, up. They got they got Cook and the yeah, other young man, um, who they love from BYU or Boise. Uh Madison. Alexander, Alexander Madison. Madison got, yeah. Yeah, they're they're solid there. I mean, the problem is Jacksonville. No, they got Travis Etienne. What about Baltimore? Baltimore, you know, with ah, uh, yeah, there you go. Well, you know what? I would have to say this is J.K. Dobbins. I don't know the medicals. I think it all depends on what Baltimore thinks of Dobbins. Right. And they probably, from what I mean, it seems looking the tea leaves, they're okay with Dobbins coming back. <laughs> you know, it should be okay. <laughs> or look, McCaffrey. For the right price, someone would That's take him. What? It just depends how much. You know, I think if the Panthers said, give us a third, he's gone tomorrow. Anyone would trade him for a third. Question what? is, can you get a second? That I'm not sure. That might be a little harder. You could trade him to the Rams. You just might have to wait till 2030 for their next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Screw that. Forget that. Well, yeah. no, look at, the, the Chiefs. The Chiefs. You know, with Zelaire, he's he's a good running back, but you need somebody like McCaffrey. McCaffrey would be perfect in an Andy Reid offense. Yeah, you know? he would. And he wouldn't have to be the full. You know, it's really not a bad call because you could have McCaffrey for sixty percent of the snaps and Hilaire for the other forty yep. percent. And I think yeah. he would benefit with having someone else to share the load. Yes. So the problem I, in Carolina was we just constantly ran him, but uh, in. In our defense, though, he did constantly. He was always trying to run out onto the field. And oh no, he hated to be benched, wasn't he? On like for ninety eight percent of the snaps or something. Yeah, like yeah. literally, he did come out. Those was he had two great years, right? The back to back, like he like never was on the bench. 
So that's a pro- yes, and obviously it's taking its toll. Yeah. Hey Tom, you got one last question here for John? Oh, any oh, any charities you want to give a shout to so our viewers can give them a look? Yeah. Any Oh, oh, um oh my god, why throw me off my fault. Um I did it with Dan Claskins and he collects money for veterans, wounded warriors. I that's think that's wonderful. Very, very and I close. did it last year for and we're going to do it again. It's just I wait till after the draft to announce my summer the summer project will be College Fantasy Football Kings Classic, and we raise money at the Kings Classic and the draft. So we'll do it again for that, Wounded Wars. I believe that's the name of it. God, I should remember that now, but I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. It's definitely, a, uh, you know, raising money for veterans hurt in yeah. Iraq, it appears. I'm I sure believe it is Wounded over. Warriors. I, I believe you are right, John. And and that is a cause that is very near and dear uh, to, to my heart, you know, as well as I'm sure across America. When I lost one of my good friends in Afghanistan. He uh, yeah. was killed in action. Um, he was only 22. Yeah. Um, so it, it's always good that the ones that do make it home, I, I love the charities that are supporting them and, and helping them to um, thrive as much as they can. Yeah. Last Especially year, I now we that raised... we have 7,000 going over to Europe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Year one, it was the first time I did. I think we got $456, which, you know, I'd like to double that this year. And I, I'm looking, I'm a big believer. I'm just a guy on the internet who loves football, loves fantasy football. If anything I can give to people that we can collect, that's just the benefits. doesn't really matter how much as long as you're giving something. So hopefully we'll do that. That's, and it makes we'll you feel good. I feel like doing things like that, like any kind of community service or charity, it, it just it gives you a really good positive feeling in your heart that really just can't be duplicated. And yeah, sometimes you never know where someone gives money. They hear the charity for the first time, and maybe a year down the road they do something to help someone. Right. Well, it yeah. doesn't have to be through me, but at least if you're hearing about the charity, you know, you, that it might come across that ah, maybe a year from now I'll do something, you know. It does. It's just promoting the charity, and, and Dan works for Veteran Affairs for the state of Kentucky. So I, that might not be the official title in Connecticut. We call it Veteran Affairs. I'm not sure what they. I think it is in Kentucky, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but when you and I have a good friend who works in Connecticut, it seems to be doing the same thing Dan does. You just, I mean, my friend tells me I'm not that as close with Dan because he's in Kentucky. But um, some of the stories that my friend tells me, it's just really sad. It, it's it it's, is. It's really okay. bad for some of these young men and women. There's also women. It's not just men, but women yeah. will come back with terrible. So if you if you know anyone who works for Veteran Affairs or served and you talk to them and you sit down with them, mm. you know, you get, lend an ear because you can learn a lot, you know, and find out a lot of things that, you know, the media is not focused on or people aren't focusing on. You know, there's some really, you know, like in Connecticut, we have homeless veterans. And I still find that deplorable as a nation absolutely. that men absolutely. or women who fought for you can't get a home. I mean, that's just, you know, I, I'm not saying you get a luxury, but come on, please. Like, <laughs> you know, there's a yeah. different, you know, and I live in a city with the decent, it's not, a, I don't know what, well, we definitely have homeless in, in a city my size, mm-hmm. you know, so every city's different, but we do have homeless people. So and I bet you there's more veterans than you think there are. People just think they're not, they're okay, but that's just not, no, when you, you know, psych- psychologically, it's not just always oh, so, you know, financial. Yeah, there's a lot of factors involved, a yeah. lot of factors, yeah. but there's more than you would think. If you actually financial. start looking out, there's more than you think. Financial right. Terms. Yeah. What, Tom? I said, I said a lot of times the, the psychological factors affect uh, the financial terms, you know, as, as far as finding work and all that. Oh, yeah, it does. But on a brighter note. Yeah. That is wonderful. Uh, it was getting a little dark there, but uh, <laughs> we're we are we are proud of of our men and women who serve, and we are sending our thoughts and good wishes to all those who are um, being deployed. You're in our thoughts, and we wish you safe returns. Which brings us now back to the draft, full circle. Um. We're gonna be we're in, we're gonna be talking in the works, Jeff, Joe, and I about you know our our draft night um, hosting. 
Um, it, I know you're busy. That's your busiest time of year. But hey, <coughs> hop on and join us. And give I think I joined you last year. Yeah, last year you came on for a couple we minutes. Really and love we had you a good pop time. You in for a few seconds and give your thoughts on. Yeah, yeah. I could definitely do that after the after the Panthers. You know, I should I should be able to do it. You know, find some time. <laughs> I can't. You know, you maybe I get lucky. And you can can call me up, I don't think so. You sure. can pop on at any point during. <laughs> I want to pick your mind, John, right now before we leave. All right. Yeah. Does the Panthers trade out of the first round and not even have trade a front out. Um Wow. Mm -hmm. I'd say no. Not they with trade. Rule possibly looking at it as the only year to uh, do something. They got to do something. So well, I'm they got to get commodity, too. They got to get some draft commodity yeah. before doing I, anything. I mean, so I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's in his mind. Let's say, hey, John, you're a Denver fan, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What's their first round pick? Tell us that one. Ooh. It's going to be a quarterback if if they if it's on the board. I the young general manager from reports that I've read, he scouted all the top seven quarterbacks personally during the season. Like he was literally going to Pittsburgh, literally going to Liberty. Who he knows, he's got a tight lip because there's not a peep coming out of Denver. Wow. So I don't know who he likes, but. He has allegedly, as of like early December, had scouted, they said, the top six quarterbacks who he has. I would assume we know the four we've discussed. Mm. I would also consider Carson Strong and Desmond Ritter. I'm assuming he's seen all six of those guys live. Hmm. So who what, what he's done, there's not a word out of if he has a favorite out of those six. So you don't think this guy double check is going over there? <laughs> oh, he is. <laughs> oh, um, so I don't want to get too optimistic, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, look, if you can get him, you get him. There, there's just no question about that. Look, at I would say I, I'll take a Super Bowl win every day. You know, if, if you get one from Aaron Rodgers, whatever you give up, it's worth it. But I'm not going to, cause everyone wants it. And I don't know if Green Bay is going to trade him now. Yeah. I don't, I'm not convinced anymore. Cause where are they, what happens to their franchise if they trade them? Jordan Love. <laughs> I mean, Lou. I actually heard a rumor what a Denver trade for Jordan Love like gave up a third or fourth round pick. But I can't believe Green Bay would be willing to take that much of a hit. You know, that takes some Keonis to say, you know, our first round pick two years ago, we're now dumping them for a third or fourth round. Mm. That's That's a hard thing to swallow when he's never really gotten on the field. We saw that game. Moody played the Chiefs that on that Sunday night game. Yeah, he I think so earlier good. like this year he looked terrible. But that's not enough to judge him in one game. I I can't. You know, it'd be hard to swallow that pill. But at this point, I think the Packers have to roll the dice on something. Either we sign, we get Rodgers, or we have to we have to get something back in return for him. Yeah, well, I mean, they're clearing. What did they clear? $10 million yeah. on the salary cap in the last 48 hours? And, and Rodgers like is not really having it right now. He's like, oh, whatever. I know. I mean, but the pa at the end of the day, the Packers still own the cards. Yeah. Mm. You know, the Packers own the cards. Look, if you get three number one picks, you get two players, you might have to consider if you're Green Bay. But that that's a that's just a boatload of value. Denver got lucky when we got Peyton Manning. He was a free agent. Didn't have to mm -hmm. give up anything from him. Right. That's, you know, he had the neck injury, if you remember. Was it spinal? I think yeah. It was like, yeah. The spinal fusion. Yeah. That's it. So, you know, to get him, you got him on the cheap because the medicals were not – there was no guarantee he was going to play. He turned out to be – you know, he got us the two Super Bowls. But um, Matt was a little lucky. He didn't have to give up a lot for him. And I think now um, with Tom Brady – the cost of Rodgers is just skyrocketing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, with Brady doing what he did for two years, it just jacked up that price even further. But wasn't Brady a free agent too, right? Yes. Yeah, he's a free. He yeah, was a free agent. That's, what? That's a lot different than giving up picks. That's thought, a big difference. Mm -hmm. I thought Rodgers had an opt-out clause in his contract this year. Yeah, but they. I think the Packers can still like they can play around with him. Oh, gotcha. Like. The NFL sneaky on this stuff. Like maybe they double secret franchise him or something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. I, I I think I do think the Packers still own the cards, or they could do what the the, the Texans did and just outright be spiteful and don't let and them play him at all. Yeah, 
I mean, wasn't he a healthy scratch all year mm-hmm. long? Like, yep. it's, it's unbelievable. And he'll just but, – um, So, I, I, I'm i now in the boat that Rodgers is going to stay Green Bay. So, that's why I answered that. Well, John, we need to tie a bow on this show here. Right. Um, we, we definitely appreciate you coming on. I, I, know, I know I learned a lot. Hopefully, our, our fans did as well. There's a lot of information in this show. That, it's always uh, so great to have you because you give it in such a dynamic way. Like I get so excited to hear it. <laughs> and I mean, I, 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 you're one of my favorite people. I love everyone, but you're one of my favorite people to have on. So oh, thank you. Uh, it's very kind. I, I do appreciate that a lot. I appreciate so, it. So John, tell us where people can find you, uh, your, your videos that you're doing. Uh, if they want to see more of you, what, where can they go? All right, so right in front there. Wait, do I got the finger right? <laughs> Gridiron Skull 91 on Twitter. I couldn't afford the A and the R when I signed up, so it's Gridiron Skull 91 on Twitter. Um, my written profiles are on footballdiehards.com. This is my ninth year. I cannot wow. believe nine years has passed. My first wide receiver class was the Mike Evans, Odell Beck. Oh, my God. What a class to start off with. And then um, my first quarterback – it was Blake Bortles I had at the top of my board. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how far back I've been going now. But I'm very pumped. Ninth year, footballdiehards.com. And my videos that Jeff referred to, go on to um, YouTube, type, type in Rookie Big Board. And my teammate, Matt Hicks, and I, we do 8 to 11-minute individual profiles of the top for fantasy, yeah. top offensive prospects. Um, and right now we have uh, – I saw the Matt Carroll one that you did just recently. That was yeah, really good. Yeah, all four quarterbacks that we talked about are up there right mm-hmm. now. Howell, Willis, Corral, and Pickett. So you can – we're doing um, Desmond Ritter this week. Um, so the quarterbacks are up there, and we have at least four shows all the way until the draft. So we hope to get 44 players done by the time we're there. So check that out, everyone. All right. Very good. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Hopefully we'll see you again at the draft with our, our, our draft party. Um, we enjoyed your, your time today as well as any time and uh, look forward to talk to you again. So thanks so much, John. You're welcome. Keep pounding everyone. All right. Until next time.